The Scarlet Letter. 10. The Leech and His Patient. Old Roger Chillingworth, throughout life, had been calm in temperament, kindly, though not of warm affections, but ever, and in all his relations with the world, a pure and upright man. He had begun an investigation, as he imagined, with the severe and equal integrity of a judge, desirous only of truth, even as if the question involved no more than the air-drawn lines and figures of a geometrical problem, instead of human passions and wrongs inflicted on himself. But, as he proceeded, a terrible fascination, a kind of fierce, though still calm, necessity, seized the old man within its gripe, and never set him free again until he had done all its bidding. He now dug into the poor clergyman's heart, like a miner searching for gold, or rather like a sexton delving into a grave, possibly in quest of a jewel that had been buried on the dead man's bosom, but likely to find nothing save mortality and corruption. Alas, for his own soul, if these were what he sought. Sometimes a light glimmered out of the physician's eyes, burning blue and ominous, like the reflection of a furnace, or, let us say, like one of those gleams of ghastly fire that darted from Bunyan's awful doorway in the hillside and quivered on the pilgrim's face. The soil where this dark miner was working had perchance shown indications that encouraged him. This man, said he at one such moment, to himself, pure as they deem him, all spiritual as he seems, hath inherited a strong animal nature from his father or his mother. Let us dig a little further in the direction of this vein. Then, after long search into the minister's dim interior, and turning over many precious materials, in the shape of high aspirations for the welfare of his race, warm love of souls, pure sentiments, natural piety, strengthened by thought and study, and illuminated by revelation, all of which invaluable gold was perhaps no better than rubbish to the seeker, he would turn back discouraged and begin his quest towards another point. He groped along as stealthily, with as cautious a tread and as wary an outlook, as a thief entering a chamber where a man lies only half asleep, or, it may be, broad awake, with purpose to steal the very treasure which this man guards as the apple of his eye. In spite of his premeditated carefulness, the floor would now and then creak, his garments would rustle, the shadow of his presence in a forbidden proximity would be thrown across his victim. In other words, Mr. Dimsdale whose sensibility of nerve often produced the effect of spiritual intuition, would become vaguely aware that something inimical to his peace had thrust itself into relation with him. But old Roger Chillingworth, too, had perceptions that were almost intuitive, and when the minister threw his startled eyes towards him, there the physician sat, his kind, watchful, sympathizing but never intrusive friend. Yet Mr. Dimsdale would perhaps have seen this individual's character more perfectly if a certain morbidness, to which sick hearts are liable, had not rendered him suspicious of all mankind. Trusting no man as his friend, he could not recognize his enemy when the latter actually appeared. He therefore still kept up a familiar intercourse with him, daily receiving the old physician in his study, or visiting the laboratory, and for recreation's sake watching the processes by which weeds were converted into drugs of potency. One day, Leaning his forehead on his hand and his elbow on the sill of the open window that looked towards the graveyard, he talked with Roger Chillingworth while the old man was examining a bundle of unsightly plants. "'Where?' asked he, with a look askance at them, for it was the clergyman's peculiarity that he seldom nowadays looked straight forth at any object, whether human or inanimate. "'Where, my kind doctor, did you gather those herbs with such a dark, flabby leaf?' "'Even in the graveyard here at hand.' "'answered the physician, continuing his employment. "'They are new to me. "'I found them growing on a grave which bore no tombstone, "'no other memorial of the dead man, "'save these ugly weeds that have taken upon themselves "'to keep him in remembrance. "'They grew out of his heart, "'and typify, it may be, some hideous secret that was buried with him, "'and which he had done better to confess during his lifetime. "'Perchance,' said Mr. Dimsdale, "'he earnestly desired it, but could not. "'And wherefore?' rejoined the physician. Wherefore not, since all the powers of nature call so earnestly for the confession of sin that these black weeds have sprung up out of a buried heart to make manifest an outspoken crime. That, good sir, is but a fantasy of yours, replied the minister. 
there can be, if I forebode aright, no power, short of the divine mercy, to disclose, whether by uttered words or by type or emblem, the secrets that may be buried in the human heart. The heart, making itself guilty of such secrets, must perforce hold them until the day when all hidden things shall be revealed. Nor have I so read or interpreted holy writ as to understand that the disclosure of human thoughts and deeds, then to be made, is intended as a part of the retribution. That surely were a shallow view of it. No, these revelations, unless I greatly err, are meant merely to promote the intellectual satisfaction of all intelligent beings who will stand waiting on that day to see the dark problem of this life made plain. A knowledge of men's hearts will be needful to the completest solution of that problem, and I conceive, moreover, that the hearts holding such miserable secrets as you speak of will yield them up at that last day, not with reluctance, but with a joy unutterable. Then why not reveal it here? asked Roger Chillingworth, glancing quietly aside at the minister. Why should not the guilty ones sooner avail themselves of this unutterable solace? They mostly do, said the clergyman, gripping hard at his breast, as if afflicted with an importunate throb of pain. Many, many a poor soul hath given its confidence to me, not only on the deathbed, but while strong in life and fair in reputation. And ever after such an outpouring, oh, what a relief have I witnessed in those sinful brethren, even as in one who at last draws free air after a long stifling with his own polluted breath. How can it be otherwise? Why should a wretched man, guilty, we will say, of murder, prefer to keep the dead corpse buried in his own heart rather than fling it forth at once and let the universe take care of it? Yet some men bury their secrets thus, observed the calm physician. True, there are such men, answered Mr. Dimsdale. But not to suggest more obvious reasons, it may be that they are kept silent by the very constitution of their nature, or, can we not suppose it, guilty as they may be, retaining nevertheless a zeal for God's glory and man's welfare, they shrink from displaying themselves black and filthy in the view of men, because thenceforward no good can be achieved by them, no evil of the past be redeemed by better service. So, to their own unutterable torment, they go about among their fellow creatures looking pure as new-fallen snow, while their hearts are all speckled and spotted with iniquity of which they cannot rid themselves. "'These men deceive themselves,' said Roger Chillingworth, with somewhat more emphasis than usual, and making a slight gesture with his forefinger. "'They fear to take up the shame that rightfully belongs to them.' Their love for man, their zeal for God's service, these holy impulses may or may not coexist in their hearts with the evil inmates to which their guilt has unbarred the door, and which must needs propagate a hellish breed within them. But, if they seek to glorify God, let them not lift heavenward their unclean hands. If they would serve their fellow men, let them do it by making manifest the power and reality of conscience in constraining them to penitential self-abasement. Would thou have me to believe, a wise and pious friend, that a false show can be better, can be more for God's glory or man's welfare than God's own truth? Trust me, such men deceive themselves. It may be so, said the young clergyman, indifferently, as waiving a discussion that he considered irrelevant or unseasonable. He had a ready faculty, indeed, of escaping from any topic that agitated his too sensitive and nervous temperament. But, now I would ask of my well-skilled physician whether, in good sooth, he deems me to have profited by his kindly care of this weak frame of mine. Before Roger Chillingworth could answer, they heard the clear, wild laughter of a young child's voice proceeding from the adjacent burial ground. Looking instinctively from the open window, for it was summertime, the minister beheld Hester Prynne and Little Pearl passing along the footpath that traversed the enclosure. Pearl looked as beautiful as the day, but was in one of those moods of perverse merriment which, whenever they occurred, seemed to remove her entirely out of the sphere of sympathy or human contact. She now skipped irreverently from one grave to another, until coming to the broad, flat, armorial tombstone of a departed worthy, perhaps of Isaac Johnson himself, she began to dance upon it. In reply to her mother's command and entreaty, that she would behave more decorously, little Pearl paused to gather the prickly burrs from a tall burdock which grew beside the tomb. Taking a handful of these, she arranged them along the lines of the scarlet letter that decorated the maternal bosom, to which the burrs, as their nature was, tenaciously adhered. Hester did not pluck them off. 
Roger Chillingworth had by this time approached the window and smiled grimly down. There is no law, nor reverence for authority, no regard for human ordinances or opinions, right or wrong, mixed up with that child's composition, remarked he, as much to himself as to his companion. I saw her the other day bespatter the governor himself with water at the cattle trough in Spring Lane. What in heaven's name is she? Is the imp altogether evil? Hath she affections? Hath she any discoverable principle of being? None save the freedom of a broken law, answered Mr. Dinsdale, in a quiet way, as if he had been discussing the point within himself. Whether capable of good, I know not. The child probably overheard their voices, for, looking up to the window with a bright but naughty smile of mirth and intelligence, she threw one of the prickly burrs at the Reverend Mr. Dinsdale. The sensitive clergyman shrank with nervous dread from the light missile. Detecting his emotion, Pearl clapped her little hands in the most extravagant ecstasy. Hester Prynne, likewise, had involuntarily looked up, and all these four persons, old and young, regarded one another in silence, till the child laughed loud and shouted, "'Come away, mother, come away, or yonder old black man will catch you. He hath got hold of the minister already. Come away, mother, he will catch you, but he cannot catch little Pearl.' So she drew her mother away, skipping, dancing, and frisking fantastically among the hillocks of the dead people, like a creature that had nothing in common with a bygone and buried generation, nor owned herself akin to it. It was as if she had been made afresh out of new elements, and must perforce be permitted to live her own life, and be a law unto herself without her eccentricities being reckoned to her for a crime. "'There goes a woman,' resumed Roger Chillingworth after a pause, "'who, be her demerits what they may, "'hath none of that mystery of hidden sinfulness "'which you deem so grievous to be born. "'Is Hester Prynne the less miserable, think you, "'for that scarlet letter on her breast?' "'I do verily believe it,' answered the clergyman. "'Nevertheless, I cannot answer for her. "'There was a look of pain in her face "'which I would gladly have been spared the sight of.' But still, methinks, it must needs be better for the sufferer to be free to show his pain, as this poor woman Hester is, than to cover it up in his heart. There was another pause, and the physician began anew to examine and arrange the plants which he had gathered. "'You inquired of me a little time agone,' said he at length, "'my judgment as touching your health.' "'I did,' answered the clergyman. "'And would gladly learn it. Speak frankly, I pray you, be it for life or death.' "'Freely, then, and plainly,' said the physician, still busy with his plants, but keeping a wary eye on Mr. Dimsdale, "'the disorder is a strange one, not so much in itself, nor as outwardly manifested, in so far at least as the symptoms have been laid open to my observation. Looking daily at you, my good sir, and watching the tokens of your aspect now for months gone by, I should deem you a man sore sick, it may be, yet not so sick but that an instructed and watchful physician might well hope to cure you.' "'but I know not what to say. "'The disease is what I seem to know, yet know it not.' "'You speak in riddles, learned sir,' said the pale minister, "'glancing aside out of the window. "'Then, to speak more plainly,' continued the physician, "'and I crave pardon, sir, should it seem to require pardon "'for this needful plainness of my speech, "'let me ask as your friend, "'as one having charge under providence "'of your life and physical well-being, "'hath all the operations of this disorder been fairly laid open and recounted to me? How can you question it? asked the minister. Surely it were child's play to call in a physician and then hide the sore. You would tell me then that I know all, said Roger Chillingworth, deliberately, and fixing an eye bright with intense and concentrated intelligence on the minister's face. Be it so. But again, he to whom only the outward and physical evil is laid open knoweth oftentimes but half the evil which he is called upon to cure. A bodily disease, which we look upon as whole and entire within itself, may after all be but a symptom of some ailment in the spiritual part. Your pardon once again, good sir, if my speech give the shadow of offense. You, sir, of all men whom I have known, are he whose body is the closest conjoined and imbued and identified, so to speak, with the spirit whereof it is the instrument. Then I need ask no further, said the clergyman, somewhat hastily rising from his chair. You deal not, I take it, in medicine for the soul. Thus, a sickness continued Roger Chillingworth, going on in an unaltered tone, without heeding the interruption, 
but standing up and confronting the emaciated and white-cheeked minister with his low, dark, and misshapen figure. A sickness, a sore place, if we may so call it, in your spirit, hath immediately its appropriate manifestation in your bodily frame. Would you, therefore, that your physician heal the bodily evil? How may this be, unless you first lay open to him the wound or trouble in your soul? No, not to thee, not to an earthly physician, cried Mr. Dinsdale passionately, and turning his eyes full and bright, and with a kind of fierceness on old Roger Chillingworth. Not to thee, but if it be the soul's disease, then do I commit myself to the one physician of the soul. He, if it stand with his good pleasure, can cure or he can kill. Let him do with me as, in his justice and wisdom, he shall see good. But who art thou that meddlest in this matter, that dares thrust himself between the sufferer and his God? With a frantic gesture, he rushed out of the room. It is as well to have made this step, said Roger Chillingworth to himself, looking after the minister with a grave smile. There is nothing lost. We shall be friends again anon. But see now how passion takes hold upon this man and hurrieth him out of himself. As with one passion, so with another. He hath done a wild thing ere now, this pious Master Dimsdale, in the hot passion of his heart. It proved not difficult to re-establish the intimacy of the two companions, on the same footing and in the same degree as heretofore. The young clergyman, after a few hours of privacy, was sensible that the disorder of his nerves had hurried him into an unseemly outbreak of temper, which there had been nothing in the physician's words to excuse or palliate. He marveled, indeed, at the violence with which he had thrust back the kind old man, when merely proffering the advice which it was his duty to bestow, and which the minister himself had expressly sought. With these remorseful feelings, he lost no time in making the amplest apologies, and besought his friend still to continue the care which, if not successful in restoring him to health, had in all probability been the means of prolonging his feeble existence to that hour. Roger Chillingworth readily assented, and went on with his medical supervision of the minister, doing his best for him in all good faith, but always quitting the patient's apartment at the close of the professional interview, with a mysterious and puzzled smile upon his lips. This expression was invisible in Mr. Dimsdale's presence, but grew strongly evident as the physician crossed the threshold. "'A rare case,' he muttered. "'I must needs look deeper into it. A strange sympathy betwixt soul and body. Were it only for the art's sake, I must search this matter to the bottom.' It came to pass, not long after the scene above recorded, that the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, noonday and entirely unawares, fell into a deep, deep slumber sitting in his chair with a large black-letter volume open before him on the table. It must have been a work of vast ability in the somniferous school of literature. The profound depth of the minister's repose was the more remarkable, inasmuch as he was one of those persons whose sleep ordinarily is as light as fitful, and as easily scared away as a small bird hopping on a twig. To such an unwanted remoteness, however, had his spirit now withdrawn into itself that he stirred not in his chair when old Roger Chillingworth, without any extraordinary precaution, came into the room. The physician advanced directly in front of his patient, laid his hand upon his bosom, and thrust aside the vestment that hitherto had always covered it, even from the professional eye. Then, indeed, Mr. Dimsdale shuddered and slightly stirred. After a brief pause, the physician turned away but with what a wild look of wonder, joy, and horror, with what a ghastly rapture, as it were, too mighty to be expressed only by the eye and features, and therefore bursting forth through the whole ugliness of his figure, and making itself even riotously manifest by the extravagant gestures with which he threw up his arms towards the ceiling and stamped his foot upon the floor. Had a man seen old Roger Chillingworth at that moment of his ecstasy, he would have had no need to ask how Satan comports himself when a precious human soul is lost to heaven and won into his kingdom. But what distinguished the physician's ecstasy from Satan's was the trait of wonder in it. <laughs>